Hi all, in the last two videos we learned about the breakdown of glucose through the processes of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Together these processes accomplish the complete catabolism of glucose. We can see this in the number of carbon dioxides produced, 6, which is equal to the number of carbons in the glucose molecule at the beginning of glycolysis. Although the glucose molecule is completely broken down by the end of the citric acid cycle, only four ATPs have been produced. We've called glucose a $38 bill, so our ATP yield is still very small. The direct energetic accomplishment of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle is not really ATP production. It's the harvesting of high energy electrons that are loaded up on all those NADH and FADH2 molecules. Remember, NADH and FADH2 are like electron taxis. We've now loaded up a bunch of those taxis, and they're now driving to their destination, the electron transport system, the ETS. It is the ETS that will make the majority of ATPs. The electron transport system is a set of proteins that accomplishes the process known as oxidative phosphorylation. In prokaryotes, these proteins are embedded within the plasma membrane. In eukaryotes, these proteins are embedded within the inner mitochondrial membrane. The electron transport system is made of two sets of structures, the electron transport chain, picture A in the upper left, and ATP synthase, picture B in the upper right. Picture C shows both the electron transport chain and ATP synthase together in the same proximity within a membrane. The electron transport chain consists of four large protein complexes called complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, and complex 4, as well as a protein called cytochrome C and a non-protein molecule called ubiquinone or coenzyme Q. Together, these molecules act like an electronic machine that functions as a proton or hydrogen ion pump. The detailed chemistry of how this machine works are beyond the scope of our class. The molecules of the electron transport system sit right next to each other in the membrane. Complex 1 is the destination for the NADH electron taxis. When NADH drops off its electrons, the empty taxi, NAD+, drives back to where glycolysis or the citric acid cycle is occurring and picks up more high energy electrons. But back to the electrons that were dropped off on complex 1. When complex 1 takes up those negatively charged electrons, it also takes up positively charged hydrogen ions to balance charge. These are taken up from the inside of the membrane. Complex 1 then hands off the electrons to the next molecule, coenzyme Q, like a game of hot potato. Complex 1 no longer needs the positively charged hydrogen ions, so it gets rid of them, but to the outside of the membrane. Coenzyme Q hands the electrons to complex 3, which does a similar taking up and getting rid of hydrogen ions when it accepts and then passes along the electrons to complex 4. Complex 4 will also take up and get rid of hydrogen ions if it accepts electrons and then has some way of getting rid of those electrons. This happens over and over again, as long as they're loaded up taxis to deliver electrons and a way of getting rid of spent electrons at the end of the chain. In most organisms, atmospheric oxygen, O2, takes the electrons from complex 4. When O2 takes on extra electrons, it will also combine with hydrogen ions to balance charge, and all those things become water. This is why we've been breathing in and using O2 in our bodies our whole lives. O2 is the garbage can for spent electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. When NADH drops off its high energy electrons, the result is the generation of an electrical current, a flow of electrons, that powers the pumping of hydrogen ions across the membrane at three points, complexes 1, 3, and 4. We end up with a high concentration of hydrogen ions outside the membrane and a lower concentration of hydrogen ions inside the membrane. That sets up a hydrogen ion diffusion gradient those hydrogen ions will tend to move from high concentration to low concentration. But hydrogen ions can't move directly through phospholipid bilayer. That means the only way that those hydrogen ions can diffuse back through the membrane is by facilitated diffusion. 
This requires a specialized transport protein, and the name of that specialized transport protein is ATP synthase. ATP synthase is not only a hydrogen ion transport protein, it's an enzyme that catalyzes the combining of ADP and inorganic phosphate to produce ATP. The active site of ATP synthase is typically closed, not in a shape to bind ADP and phosphate. Now remind yourself, what is the active site of an enzyme? Good. The active site is a special pocket uh, in the enzyme that's sized and shaped and has charge pattern to bind the substrates of the reaction. But AT synth ATP synthase also has allosteric sites. So remind yourselves, what are allosteric sites on enzymes? Remember, allosteric sites are non-active site locations where other chemicals can bind. And hydrogen ions can bind to those allosteric sites. The binding of hydrogen ions causes ATP synthase to undergo a shape change that opens its active site, allowing it to bind ADP and phosphate and catalyze the production of ATP. The more hydrogen ions there are on the outside of the membrane where ATP synthase's allosteric site is located, the more ATP can be produced. So, as long as electrons keep getting loaded onto the electron transport chain, and the electron transport chain keeps pumping hydrogen ions, ATP synthase can continue to produce ATPs. Notice the other electron taxi, FADH2, drops off its electrons onto complex 2. This means that those electrons only accomplish hydrogen ion pumping on complexes 3 and 4. Complex 1 is bypassed. With fewer hydrogen ions being pumped across, the electrons from FADH2 produce fewer ATPs, 2 ATP per FADH2, than do the electrons from NADH, 3 ATPs per NADH. To summarize, the electron transport system is a set of proteins that uses high-energy electrons to first create a hydrogen dif ion diffusion gradient and then uses those hydrogen ions to activate the enzyme ATP synthase, which catalyzes the production of ATP. The electron transport system is embedded in the plasma membrane of prokaryotes and the inner mitochondrial membrane of eukaryotes. The electron transport system is where the bulk of ATPs are produced. The electrons from each of the 10 NADHs can yield up to, third, up to 3 ATPs for a subtotal of 30 ATPs. The electrons from the two FADH2s can yield up to 2 ATPs for a subtotal of 4 ATPs. That means the electron transport system overall can produce up to 34 ATPs. And when the two ATPs from glycolysis and the two ATPs from the citric acid cycle are included, that's a grand total of up to 38 ATPs. Prokaryotic cells have 38 ATPs as a theoretical maximum production for each glucose molecule. Eukaryotic, eukaryotic organisms have a lower maximum production because we have to spend a couple of ATPs transporting the pyruvates and NADHs from glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm, into the mitochondrial membrane where the citric acid cycle occurs. So prokaryotic cells are theoretically more efficient at ATP production than are us eukaryotes. It turns out most organisms produce fewer than the theoretical maximum because of a variety of inefficiencies. But still, several dozen ATPs per glucose, that's what keeps us going.